For April Fool's 1996, Bob Pease asked this question in his column in Electronics Design Magazine. Take an ordinary NPN transistor, ground a base, pull the emitter up to 12 volts with a 1K resistor, and measure the collector voltage, reference to ground, obviously. I have a 2N2222 here with a 1 kOhm resistor soldered in line with the emitter. Let's connect the 12V power and ADMM as shown on the schematic. You may want to pause the video right now and decide what you think the voltage will be, but don't waste too much time as the real question is not what voltage we'll get, but where this voltage comes from. Let's turn on the meter and flip the power switch. On the 200V range we get minus 0.3 of a volt. On 20 volts we get minus 0.39 of a volt, and on 2 volts we get negative 399 millivolts. Wow, negative voltage with respect to ground when the only power rail in the whole circuit is positive 12 volts? What gives? Let me give you a hint. I'll try to decrease the supply voltage a bit. As you can see, not much happens for a bit, and then, well, quite a lot happens. Either way, at 7 or 8 volts, I'm reading negative 356 millivolts or so, but watch this. When I change the DMM range to 200 millivolts, I only get around negative 163 millivolts. Almost 200 millivolts less. That's because on this voltage range, my DMM has an input resistance of only 1 megaohm, as opposed to the 10 megaohm of all the other ranges. Enough horsing around, time for an explanation. And what an explanation it is. I remember I could not stop laughing for solid 10 minutes when I first read it. Okay, as I'm sure many of you know, at 6, 7, 8, whatever, volts in reverse, the base emitter junction of a bipolar junction transistor breaks down. The exact voltage depends on the type of the transistor. Some RFBJTs break down at only 2 or 3 volts. Either way, we're limiting the reverse current with a 1 kilo ohm resistor to a couple of milliamps, because we don't want to fry the transistor. But how does that translate to the negative voltage we get? Well, and this is the fun part. Under breakdown, the junction starts to emit light, just like an LED. Almost like an LED. A very, very crappy LED. But we'll get to that. Now, this light apparently then goes through the silicon lattice itself and makes the base collector junction act like a photodiode. And that's what we're measuring. A poorly lit photodiode. The fact that the light is able to traverse through the silicon itself is why it works even in a plastic encapsulated transistor. This also explains why we got a different voltage when we used the 200 millivolt 1 mega ohm range. Bob also said that the collector current in this situation is roughly one ten thousandth of the emitter current. And that after doing this you should probably throw out the transistor, as it might have become damaged or some of its characteristics might have changed. So, the transistor is supposed to emit red light under emitter base breakdown. I want to see that. I have an old 2N3055 here, which I'll try my best to open. I expect the light to be very dim, because silicon is an indirect band gap material, which, due to the conservation of crystal momentum, means that most of the recombinations that take place are non-radiative. Instead of emitting light, they heat up the junction. I'm not quite sure what the exact emitter base breakdown mechanism is, but I'm guessing avalanche, as that's what's happening in higher voltage Zener diodes. Long story short, I'm not an expert in semiconductor physics, but if any of you are, please leave a comment with your thoughts down below. Enough sewing, let's zoom in. Turn off the lights. And increase the exposure time. Well, I'll be damned. Believe it or not, it actually took 20 volts to break down the emitter base junction of this ancient transistor. Unfortunately, I could not see any glow with my own eyes, but there you have it, some light is being emitted. As for why the light emissions seem localized, I have no idea. I did find a paper from 1956 titled Photon Emissions from Avalanche Breakdown in Silicon that mentioned red spots, but also white and yellowish spots. Interestingly, according to the paper, when the current increased, the number of spots increased, but not their brightness. As for my own thoughts, well, the spots reminded me of a low-quality 100 watt LED I own. The matching between individual 1 watt LEDs there is quite poor, so when it's barely on, you get dimmer and brighter spots. 
but I think it has nothing to do with any of this, it just looks cool too. So, thanks for watching, see you next time.